It's wonderful to see those of you who are not yet on holiday or who have returned from holiday, uh, quite a few away, but it's wonderful uh, to see those of you who are here this morning. And I wonder whether you've had opportunity this morning to consider how special it is that we meet together as, as God's people. When we, when we gather together, he is amongst us. He is amongst us in a, in a special way when we gather like this. And so we, we come, I hope, with expectant hearts, hearts to receive from him this morning as we gather together as his people in fellowship, as we worship him and as we are fed by him in his words and as we meet in deep fellowship. Now, I don't know how your week has been. I'm sure there's, uh, it's been a mixed week for many of us. So we're going to just take a, a moment of quiet in a moment to still our hearts, to lay our burdens at his feet, to, to come to his open arms and to receive his love and peace. And I'm going to read some scripture just to allow him to speak to us as we begin our time and then we'll have a moment's quiet. So this is Psalm 33, which I read this morning in one of my devotionals, such a beautiful psalm. Let me read it to you. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright. And all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever and the plans of his hearts to all generations. Our souls wait for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our hearts are glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Let us take a moment's quiet. Use those last couple of verses to bring your burdens to him and to allow, ask him to speak to you this morning. Let's take a moment's quiet together. Oh, Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this special time together as your people. And Lord, our souls do indeed wait for you. We come to you as our help and our shield. Our heart is glad in you because we trust your holy name. Let your steadfast love, O oh Lord, be upon us as we hope in you. Lord, would your spirit work in every single heart, young and old this morning, would you feed us, encourage us, send us out loving you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what a loving Heavenly Father we have, and it is now an opportunity to rejoice and praise him as we sing our first two songs. Please do stand as the musicians begin. Blessings are 
Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is good. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen.
Wonderful. Please do take your seats. What a joyful noise. I definitely encourage you to sit at the front because you get to hear all the voices at the front much better. Uh, wonderful singing. Thank you so much. Um, if you weren't aware, you might have already worked it out with this uh, bit of string running across that it is an all-age service, uh, so it will be a little bit different to our normal services. Uh, and for the youngsters, if you haven't already got one, there's a worksheet that Chris has prepared with lots of colouring and questions uh, that will hopefully keep you engaged and uh, enjoying your time. So if you haven't got one, they're at the back. You can put your hand up. Maybe someone will bring one to you, but do, do grab one of those. Thank you to Chris for preparing that. Just a few little bits of church family news and notices. Um, as we have said before, there are no official church prayer meetings through the summer months as lots of people are away and uh, uh, it makes it a little bit harder to organize. But please do feel free. We do, do not want you to, to stop praying. Feel free to uh, organize your own get togethers where you can pray together and uh, share in fellowship. Please uh, do do that. Um, and summer is a time when uh, lots of people are moving and uh, there will be new people moving into the area. Maybe you'll bump into some uh, new faces over the next few weeks and months, new neighbours. I just want to remind you of our welcome cards that uh, we had produced a little while ago. Wonderful kind of business uh, card type size. So you can easily slip them into your wallet or in your pocket to carry around with you. And it's just an easy way of just saying, hey, welcome to the area. Why don't you come and try out our church sometime? We'd love to have you. And remember, we're trying to encourage each other to each week, each one, invite one so that we can invite people into this wonderful gathering that we have on a Sunday morning and introduce them to Jesus Christ. So please do grab some of those if you've run out already. Just a couple of things as well. Um, as the new term begins, it would be great to fill our rotors. So please do put down any dates you're going to be away so that we can start to put those things together and there are a uh, need for some people to serve in different areas so I think tea and coffee could do with a couple more people youth group on a Monday evening could do with some more volunteers to help out there and also uh, the setup of uh, the tech the sound and things if that's something you'd like to get involved in um, Andy would very much appreciate your help in that so please do speak to him um, Lots of people away on holidays, but also uh, on camps as well. Richard is headed off to serve on Contagious West, is it? Is that right? Yeah, Contagious West uh, this week. Please do be praying for him and uh, for those of us who are going to head off on East. Lots of preparations to do over the next few weeks. Please do be praying for that. And I did mention a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I made a special point of it then, but I think this is Brenda and Andy's last Sunday with us, so please do make an effort to go and say goodbye to them, uh, pray with them as they head off uh, to Pastors New, uh, and we do pray for you as you go. Pray that uh, the Lord will provide for you there, a uh, wonderful church family, uh, and uh, that uh, you're blessed uh, as you move there. We're going to continue in prayer. Ruth's going to come up and lead our time of prayer now, uh, so I will hand over to her. Let's pray together. Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Father, thank you that this morning we can come before you, the eternal God of all time and space. Thank you that you have opened our eyes to your glory and your majesty so that we can praise and worship you, which is what we were made to do. Only in your presence, our Father, do we find the life that we long for, fullness of life, as we experience the joy and peace that comes from knowing and loving you. Thank you, Father, for bringing us into such a relationship with you. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us to make it possible. Father, we confess that we're like sheep, so often going astray, we long to live wholeheartedly for you and to glorify you, yet our hearts are weak and there's no area of our lives left untouched by our sin. We so often struggle to put to death the desires within us. How we thank you for your son, Jesus, who washes all our sin away and makes us white as snow, who comes to us when we wander and graciously restores us, who gives us his spirit so that we can do battle with our sin in his strength. Please help us to accept the forgiveness you offer so freely when we repent. Help us to rejoice and be glad in it, and not to wallow in guilt or shame that you have freed us from. And please help us to live by your spirit, growing in your ways by your power. We pray for Helen and Hannah as they serve you in Ukraine. 
please help them as they use their gifts there to support Nipro Hope Mission in their work with displaced families and make them a blessing to all they come into contact with. Please give them safety and good health as they travel to Moldova tomorrow and continue to use them there. We also want to ask for your blessing on Andy and Brenda as they make the move to their new home. We ask that you would help them to settle into their church family there really quickly and that you would provide all they need in this next season of their lives. We pray for the various contagious camps taking place across the summer and thank you for the encouragement of how smoothly they have all gone so far and how responsive the young people have been to your word. We pray for all the youth and leaders going to contagious from our church here and ask that it would be a wonderful time of fellowship and of growing in knowledge of you. And Father, we want to bring before you our broken land. Our society is so fractured by conflict and pain. We need you, Father. We know that only hope lies in you. So we pray particularly for the local churches in places where there's been rioting and terrible events this week. Please help your people there to know the role you'd have them play in their communities and give them opportunities to show your love and to speak of you. And we pray for our leaders and all those trying to establish order and bring peace. Please give them your wisdom and strength. And please raise up godly voices to speak your words as decisions are made. We also pray on for the conflict in the Middle East and in Ukraine and we ask that your will would be done. Please humble the proud and lift up the humble. Please grant insight and great wisdom to those trying to carve out a way towards peace. And please protect your people and use them in the darkness to bring your light. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I encourage you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2? And we're going to come to a time of communion in just a moment. But it'd be great to, again, allow God to speak to us as we come to that special time. And uh, I'm going to read from the first few verses of Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Our salvation is a gift of God's grace, totally undeserved, and yet God chose to give us this gift before the beginning of time. Isn't that amazing? He chose you. If you are trusting him, he chose you before the beginning of time itself. It's the greatest gift we can receive because it brings us into his family. And there are, there are two what we call ordinances that he calls us to participate in as his people. The first is, is baptism, and the second is what we call communion. God's grace is open to all. He opens his arms to all who will return to him, as we'll see in our passage later on. And if you're here today, and you are someone who has received that grace... You have turned back to God and been baptised into his family, then you are welcome to join in with this family meal now. But if you have not received, yet received God's grace, then please just pass the bread and the grape juice on 
Use this time to consider this passage. Read through this passage again. See the grace that he offers you. So we're going to participate in this family meal together. And first we will pass around the bread which signifies Christ's body that was broken for us on the cross, taking the punishment that we deserve for rejecting God. As the basket comes around, please do take of the bread and give God great thanks for his sacrifice for you on his behalf. And if you're sat in a family, then maybe take this opportunity to teach your children about this again. If you're sat with people around you and you would like to share something of of God's grace that you have experienced in your life this week, then then use this time to talk about that. It's it's a family meal. I, I don't know about you, but in my family, meals are noisy and we're talking. So use this first course, the the bread, to share of God's grace together. Speak of something that you've experienced in your life this week of his grace. Uh, So if the servers could come up uh, to uh, prepare and uh, have the bread ready, I'm going to pray and then we'll pass the bread around. And please do eat of it at that point uh, and uh, please do share of the grace that you know of, of God in your life. Let's pray. Father, we do praise you for your son. We thank you that he was willing to step down into this broken world and to take the punishment that we deserve. Lord, we are so grateful for your grace. We thank you that it is all of Christ. We thank you that he has, you have opened our blind eyes to see your truth, that we need you and how you have brought us back into loving relationship with you. Lord, help us now as we share this time of grace together, as we share this bread, to remember all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
your dinner tables are much more civilized than mine. We're now going to share the grape juice, which symbolizes Jesus' blood that washed us clean. Washed us clean so that we can now come to him and confess our sin, confident that we are made clean. As the grape juice comes round, uh, hold on to it and take a moment of quiet this time uh, to come before your Lord, to confess your sins, the ways that you have not walked with him this week, the ways that you've rejected him, the ways that you've not loved others or him as you should have done, and give it to him. Lay it at his feet and thank him for his forgiveness, that he has washed you clean. So the wine will come around, hold on to it. Uh, as we come back together after that moment of quiet, we'll pray and we'll drink the wine together. read from Psalm 33. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Sorry, wrong wrong Psalm. Psalm 32. (laughs) Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave me the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous and shout for joy all you upright in heart. Father, we praise you that in Christ we find forgiveness. We thank you that as we have brought our sins to you this morning, we can be confident they have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus. And we want to praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us drink together. Could we just um, have the first bit of the, the song, the first slide? Oh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, the first slide of the second song we're about to sing, sorry. That's it. I love the, uh, the opening lines of this song that we're gonna sing in just a moment. 
Grace unmeasured, vast and free, that knew me from eternity. We just read that, didn't we, in Ephesians? That called me out before my birth to bring you glory on this earth. That is what we're called to do. We are brought together as people of grace to bring him glory. What a joy, what a privilege that is. And in a moment, we're going to stand and sing uh, two songs that sing of the grace of, of God that we've just been uh, celebrating in that meal. It's also an opportunity to give to the work of uh, the gospel that we are seeking to proclaim in this area. So the bags will be handed round. If uh, this is the way that you prefer to give, then please do uh, use this opportunity to give in that way. Many here give by standing order. Uh, and if you're a visitor, please do not feel any obligation to give. This is really for those who are regular members to be giving to the work of the church. Uh, if I can invite the musicians to come back up. We're going to start by singing uh, that very well-known gospel spiritual Amazing Grace and then we're going to sing Grace Unmeasured. So when the musicians begin, let us stand and make a joyful noise to the Lord again. Please stand, church.
do take your seats and open your Bibles again to Luke 15. Pavel's going to come and read for us. Um, I have forgotten to mention that we do have a creche available. Um, the children are very welcome to stay with this as long as they are uh, enjoying their time and uh, engaging. But if you would uh, like to take them out, there is a room set aside out uh, in the corridor that you can take them to uh, where, they will be, uh, where, where you can look after them out there. Uh, Pavel's going to come up and read from Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. And then moving to another passage. I will read from Luke 15, verse 1 and 2. And then we will read from 11. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And then verses from 11. And Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to, the, to be fed with the pots that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, 
Look, this many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this, is your, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I've done something I said I wouldn't do last time, is I've got another bit of technology. So I'm hopeful we have some sound today. Go on, press play, and let's see if we've got some. Yes. Go on. What is that? <laughs> no. Yes. No. 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 Yes. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Away. <laughs> so, children, who knows best, you or your parents? I wonder what you think. Do you know better? That was little Jimmy, my brother's uh, little baby. He obviously thought he knows better than his father. Don't we always think that we know best? Uh, we want to live life our own way. Um, it seems the best way to make us happy, doesn't it? We want to do things our way. We want to play the computer games we want to play. We want to wear the clothes we want to play, wear. But what if that isn't true? What if living our way isn't the best way? So today we're going to look at the parable of the lost... I'm going to call it the parable of the lost son. Your Bible might say the parable of the prodigal son, but I think more accurately it should be the prodigal of the lost son. Now, uh, young people, can anyone tell me, what is a parable? What is a parable? Rory. That's right, so something Jesus told his follow followers, that's true. So it's a story that's not real, um, absolutely, and it's a story and it's got a spiritual lesson, really good answer. So in this parable that we've just looked at, we're introduced to this youngest son who wants to live his own way. He doesn't want to listen to his father and he thinks he knows best. And it has disastrous consequences. But to understand this parable, you have to look at the context. You have to look at why Jesus told this parable. So if you look back at verse 1 and 2, which Pavel read for us, have a look at what is going on. Have a look at the situation Jesus is in. Jesus is being surrounded by tax collectors and sinners. Okay? These are sinful people. These are tax collectors. Imagine the scene. They're all around Jesus. And looking on are the Pharisees and the religious lead leaders and they're grumbling and they're saying, I can't believe that Jesus is letting these sinful people hang around him. They're grumbling. They're thinking, Jesus should send these sinful people away. Jesus shouldn't be wasting time with these bad people. Jesus, 
We are the good people. We're the religious people. Why aren't you spending time with us, listening to us? And Jesus knows what they're saying, and so he tells three stories. Now, I've lost my keys, young children. I've lost my keys. I, I woke up this morning, I'd lost them. Do you think you can find them? I think they're in the room somewhere. You might have to get out of your seat. Have a look around. Anyone know? You might have to get out of your seat and walk around. Anyone see my keys? I've lost my keys. I'm stressing out about it. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Good job. Good searching. Thank you. Oh, that's a relief. That is a relief. I wonder if you've ever lost something. I'll put it in this pocket. Thank goodness. If I didn't have my keys, what would I do? How would I get home? We'd be stuck. We'd have to leave our car in the car park and it'd be left at school all week. Well, all summer. That'd be a nightmare, wouldn't it? Losing things is awful. So, I don't know if you've ever lost your cuddly toy. That's pretty devastating, isn't it? Yeah, you have. Yeah, it's really, that makes people really sad. Cry. Um, adults, have you lost your keys or your wallets? Can you, your wallet, can you remember what that makes you feel like? Or maybe the worst thing in our modern society, your phone. Have you ever lost your phone? What would you do without your phone? Your life would be over. <laughs> but it's a really happy thing when you find a lost thing, isn't it? When, you, when I've lost my keys and I find them, isn't that such a good feeling? Well, Jesus... He talks about three things that were lost. So he told a story in verse 3 to 7 about a sheep, a shepherd who lost his sheep. He had 100 sheep. He lost one of them. And, and then it was found. He went to find it, and he brought it back. And he says in uh, the end of that passage, verse uh, 7, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So that was his first lost thing, a lost sheep. The second lost thing in verse 8 to 10 is a coin. There's a woman. She's lost one of her coins, and, and she's searching for it. And when, and when she finds it, she rejoices. She is really happy because she's found this coin. And it says at the end of that passage, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There is joy over a sinner who repents. And finally, he tells this longer story about a son. He's a younger son. And he's twice, in verse 24 and verse 32, described as lost. He's a lost son. Like this lost sheep and a lost coin, the son is lost. And Jesus wants us to learn something about lost things and how God thinks about lost things. So we're going to focus on this parable, and we're going to focus on the three characters. We're going to focus on the youngest son, then we're going to look at the father, and then we're going to look at the oldest son. And we're going to see what Jesus wants us to learn from them. So the first one, the youngest son. The younger son, verse 12, comes to his father, he says, Father, give me the share of the property that's coming to me. He divided his property between them, the father, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and he took a journey into a far country and there he squandered. That means he, he, he lost it all. He squandered his property in reckless living. And I want to sum up this son's um, way of living with some signs. You, everyone's wondering what the why is up here for because I've got some signs for us. Right. So... Uh, this is how I want us to um, think about the youngest son. First of all, let's put this this side. He wants to live my way. That's what he's doing. He's saying, I want to live my way. That's the first thing he wants to do. My way. Not your way, Father. I want to live my way. And... He wants this, let me put the second one up, right now. He doesn't want to wait. It's an inheritance, so he's going to receive an inheritance when his dad dies. He doesn't want to wait. He wants it right now. I'm going to squeeze through here. And the third thing I want us to see is that it is without you. 
He doesn't want to do it with his father. Okay? Let's repeat that back to me so I know you've got it. So it is, the first one. Brilliant. A bit louder. Good. Okay. My way. I want to live my own life. Right now. He doesn't want to wait for it. He wants his share of the property. And without you, he doesn't want anything to do with his father or his brother. He wants it right now. He wants it his way. And he doesn't want anything to do with his dad. And guess what? This way of living is how we nearly all try to live in this world. We nearly all try to live our way right now without God. That is how we want to live. So you might, an example of this, you might think, why do I come to church? I would have preferred to do something fun on a Saturday, go out late, and then have a lion on a Sunday. Church is hard work. Wouldn't it be much nicer if I was just in bed right now? That would be better. Or maybe you think, maybe on a Sunday, I would much prefer to play for a sports team. I love sports. Sport is better. I mean, this church stuff, this God stuff, it's a waste of my time. I don't need God. What I want is sport. That's the best thing. I want to have fun right now. God can wait. I want fun right now. Maybe some of you are going to head off to university and you think, that's a chance for me to enjoy myself. My parents have held me back. My parents have stopped me having fun. But when I go away, they're not there to watch me. I can have fun. I don't need to worry about God. He's cramping my style. This might be the way we think. We don't need God. We can live the better life. But what does Jesus say was the result of this young boy's um, going away from his father? What was the result? Well, in verse 14, we read that he wasted his money and he had nothing left to feed himself. In verse 15, we read he has to work with the pigs. Now, in Jewish culture, that's much worse than even we would think. We would think, oh, I don't want to work with the pigs. But in their culture, pigs were unclean. So that's the worst thing that you can do is go and work with the pigs. And he's so hungry, he wants... Nasser, if you can do the next picture. He wants to eat the pigs' pods. And I've got a picture of a pig's food. Now, every picture you get of pig's food, it is disgusting. Uh, I don't exactly know what pods are, but like, it's vile. And he is so hungry, he wants to eat that stuff. And he's jealous of his pigs. And he's like, I wish I could eat that pig's food. That is how hungry he is. He is desperate for food. And, and he goes, my father's servants, even the lowest people in my father's house, they have food to spare. And here I am starving to death. He's starting to question his attitude to life. He's starting to think that my way right now without you is maybe not the best way to live. And so he's humbled and he goes, I'm going to return to my father. And he prepares a speech. He's going to go back to his father. He says, I've I've, I've sinned against you, father. I've messed up. Let me live as a servant, but at least I'll have food. At least I'll be okay. And before we move on, let's think about this. If this is the way that we think that we should live, we think about Jimmy, I'm do it my way, not your way, Dad. That's what we're born doing. We want to do things our way. If we live that way, what happens? Hopefully, at some point, we realize that God's way is better, that God is a provider, that God is someone that we should go to. Now, children, What would you expect your dad to do if you do lots of bad things? What would you expect your dad to do if you do lots of bad things? Yeah. Turn off your phone. Yeah? That is a very brutal punishment there from Andy Davis. To turn off your phone. Yeah? Punish you. Punish you. Yeah, absolutely. I would have done. Uh, Yeah, uh, we would have had the smack bottom, I think. Destroy your PC console. That is very extreme. 
Yeah, you, uh, you'd expect, yeah, go on, Toby. Send you to your room, okay. That's, that's, is that the worst it could get if you've sent to your room? Is there anything worse than that? <laughs> Sorry? Xbox taken away is the, is the most extreme of the punishments. Okay, very good. Yeah, that's what we expect our parents to do, isn't it? When we do bad things in this life, we expect people to be punished. And this son is expecting to be punished, but he's going back to his father. But what do we find in the story? So number two, the father. Listen to how the father responds. Listen carefully. There's lots of things the father does when the son comes back. It says in verse 20, The son arose and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, okay, he's a little speck in the distance, he's coming back. See him in your... He's coming back, he's in the distance. His father saw him. And he felt compassion. His father loved him. And his father ran. And his father embraced him with a big hug. And he kissed him. And the son, he starts doing his speech. He's got a speech ready, so he starts doing it. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father doesn't listen to him. The father says to his servants, quickly, bring the robe, put it on him. Put on a ring on his hands. Put shoes on his feet. This is all stuff that represents that this son is his son, okay? The robe, the ring, the shoes, they're all pointing to the fact that the son is still the father's son. And the, the father is making a big deal out of this. And then the father says, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead. He is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, how does the father's attitude change from that of his son's? Well, I want to suggest that it's actually very similar. The father wants to do things his way. He stays at his house. His son has to return. It's still my way. More surprisingly, it's also still right now. He says to his, father, his son, he doesn't say to his son, you have to work really hard to get back my love. He doesn't say you have to do lots of chores before I'm be happy with you. He says, no, you can have my love right now. But one thing has changed. I'm going to change this over here. Instead of being without you, what's it going to be? With you. With you. That's great. With you. My way right now with you. That is the way the father once lives. My way right now with you. And he loves his son. Did you notice that? He was looking for him in the distance. He ran to him. People, men in that culture didn't run. That was, that was very unseemly for them to do it. But he ran, and he loves his son, and he embraces his son, and he kisses his son. And he says he was lost, but he's found. He was dead, but he's alive. Do you re realise what God is saying to you about his love towards you? If it's not obvious already, in the story, God is the Father. And Jesus is trying to show you something. He's saying that God's love is amazing. God's love is incredible. God's love sees a sinner who's messed up and he wants them to come back to him. And when they come back to him, he's going to run to them and he's going to love them and he's going to embrace them and he's going to throw a party. So we're going to do a party. Right, who's younger ones? Come here and have a party hat. This is a party time. Come on, up you come. Party hats. Go put that on. It's party time. Get those hats on. Right, there you go. Oh, it's a perfect number. Right, go sit down. Right, youth group. There's a the youth group. Up you come. It's a party. You're going to have party poppers. Everyone knows that. Don't point them at people's faces. Right. There you go. Party popper, party popper. 
party time. Right, and now we're gonna see how well these guys are at timing. There you go, party popper. Back to your seats. There you go. So, every time, right, you, got, you got to do this right, okay? I'm gonna get one. Oh, Happy wants one. Right, every time a sinner becomes a Christian in heaven, I'm gonna give you a countdown, okay? There's a party. So, three, two, one. Yeah! It actually worked. <laughs> So, every time a sinner becomes a Christian in heaven, the angels celebrate. There is a party. It's party time because God loves lost sinners and he wants... This is really cool that that caught on there. And he, and he wants... And he celebrates. And he's telling this story to say, look, this is a celebration. I love lost sinners. I want them to come back to me. And if they come back, I'm going to kill the fan calf because it's party time. Party popper time. So that's what we have to learn. But there is a problem because there is a third, not a third person who's the oldest son. Because I don't know if you notice from the story, but the oldest son is very upset. He is very upset. How dare my father throw a party? How dare he? My younger brother has wasted all his money. He is a sinner. He is a bad person. He deserves a punishment. How can my father throw a party? It says in verse 25, the oldest son was in the field. As he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant, and he said to him, your brother has come back. And your father's killed the fat and calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry. And he refused to go in. You can do your, your best angry faces, young people. Okay? Some of you are really angry. Some not so much. Some just look ambivalent. <laughs> Any other good angry faces? Oh, yeah, there's some good ones back there. Good. Yes, he was angry. Well, who is the oldest son like in our story? The oldest son is like the religious leaders. The oldest son thinks that they deserve God's blessing and that they don't like Jesus being with sinners. Let's go back to the oldest son attitude. See, the oldest son still wants it to be his way. He says, I want it to be my way where I get the privilege, because I've stayed, and my youngest brother doesn't get anything. He wants it to be right now, because he says to his father, you didn't even give me a goat to celebrate with my friends. But we're going to go back. The youngest son says, let me change it over, my way right now without you because he doesn't want to celebrate with his father he refuses to go into the party he doesn't want to go in he's not going to celebrate and he says to his dad you never gave me a goat to celebrate with my friends he doesn't even want to celebrate with his dad he just wants to celebrate with his guys and so Jesus is teaching us a lesson He's saying, don't be like these religious leaders. They think they're serving God by keeping the rules. Maybe they're like people who go to church, who think that they're really righteous, but they don't love sinners. They're not like God. What does the Father do? The Father loves sinners. But what does the oldest son do? He hates sinners. He doesn't want anything to do with them. But the father wants the oldest son to see that if he wants to truly follow in his father's footsteps, he needs to love those 
who have messed up and who need forgiveness. So do you think you deserve God's love because you're good or that you're not as bad as someone else at school? Then see in this story that God says that we all don't deserve God's love, but he's shown us grace. That's why we've been singing lots of songs about amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. God wants us to realise, we're just finishing, so listen to me carefully here. God wants us to realise that we are undeserving of his love and we all need his mercy. God wants us to see that we are all sinners, every single one of us, and he wants us to see how much he will celebrate if we return to him. If we come back to him, he and his angels and heaven will celebrate when lost sinners come back to him. But he also wants us to see that we shouldn't sit here and think, I'm all right, I'm righteous, I don't need to ask for forgiveness, I don't think that person over there should be saved. No, God wants us to be like him and show grace towards others who are lost. Let's pray. Dear Lord and God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for telling us this parable that shows us just how great your love is. That though we run away, though we sin and we mess up and we go astray in so many different ways, that if we return to you, you will be there waiting with your arms outstretched, ready to hug us and run to us and to kiss us and to say, there's a party for you because you were lost and now you're found. Lord, we pray that we would be like the younger son, that we would realise that it is better to go back to you, to live your way right now with you. And I pray for anyone who is sitting here today who thinks that they're righteous, who thinks they don't need forgiveness. Lord, I pray that you would show them that everybody falls short of God's glory, that no one is righteous before a holy God, that we wouldn't sit here grumpy about God's grace, but that we would be excited to tell tell other people that you love us and you have forgiven us, even though we were undeserving. We do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And the musicians come up, and we're now going to sing our last song. Which is how deep the Father's love for us. How deep is the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give. That's, this is how he proved it to us. He gave his only son who made a wretch his treasure. <laughs> oh, well, please stand, church. I might have a chance of seeing you then. <laughs>
read again from Psalm 32. This is David speaking 2,000 years before those amazing events of Jesus taking that punishment for us. He wrote this. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. That is why we can run into the arms of our Father. Praise God. Amen.